Okay, let's get into this. I don't know why this room's so loud about this thing. All right, so as we get started with some actual Scala content and some programming content, I just want to point out one important thing. There are a lot of examples that I'll show in lectures, a lot of uh, code as examples. To see all those examples, you can go to the course GitHub link. I recommend cloning this whole repo. If you don't know what that means, uh, don't worry, lab next week will get you caught up on that. But we have this repo full of all the code examples split up by weeks. So week one, basics. We'll be looking at a few of the classes in here. Oh, sorry, objects in here uh, today. So if you want to follow along with the code directly, instead of following along the slides where I, uh, I might click off the code, you can check those out. You can, uh, I highly recommend throughout the whole semester, take these examples, edit the examples, play around with them, and then run them to see what those changes do. When you change the code in a particular way, you, if you have an idea of what it's supposed to do, make that change and then make sure that's what it does actually do. If you tinker around with these, you'll learn, end up learning a lot more about how these concepts really do work um, than you will just watching me click through slides. So, with that, let's, do, let's learn some Scala. Uh, we'll go through it very quickly. Uh, between today and Friday, we'll effectively go through modules one and two from last semester, uh, and maybe a few topics from uh, from three and four. Actually, I don't know if anything from three and four. And then after we go through the semester, we'll bring back those module three and four topics as well. We uh, we may do a little bit of Python. Uh, my original intent of the course was to do Scala and Python in parallel uh, and show all the concepts of both languages. That got to be way too much, uh, and I kind of abandoned that early in the semester last time. So this time, just uh, almost no Python. There won't be any, and what I mean by that, there won't be any assessments of Python. I won't ask you to write Python code this semester. But in lecture, I might show you two returns a double, so Scala is able to figure it out what this is supposed to be. Okay, result's supposed to be a double because you're immediately assigning it the result to multiply by two. It figures that out and makes that variable type double. So it's effectively the same as if I explicitly said it's a type double. So Scala helps us out here. Uh, Scala is a language that does help us out quite a bit in instances like that. So result, we're not declaring the, that type directly, but since it's unambiguous, Scala's able to figure it out. Now there are some ambiguities uh, when there is an ambiguity, either two, one of two things is going to happen. Either Scala is going to guess, which means it can guess wrong. So, for example, if I don't have double here and I didn't put my point O here, I just said equals 7, x is going to be an integer. And I'm, I don't want that, I want it to be a double. Uh, so it could guess and it could guess wrong and break my code. Or two, it'll just give you a compiler error, which will just say, what's the type of this? I don't know what's going on. I can't figure this out. Fix your code because I'm not going to run it. Um, so one of those two things are going to happen. But if, uh, if there's no ambiguity, you're going to be fine. Uh, any questions so far? Yep. So in Scala, you're still fine each type. What happens when you have like a double and like are those no longer compatible at all? So the question is, uh, you have to clear your test. What happens if you have like a double and an int and you're trying to combine them? Uh, this is another case where Scala will try to infer the type. So for example, if you add a double and an int, it'll still just add a line. Uh, and I believe in that case, it'll just return a double. Uh, but uh, uh, so Scala will try to figure it out. It does help us out a lot in converting the types automatically. But if they are incompatible, it's going to start causing issues. Uh, for example, if you have a method that returns an int and you assign it to a variable that you explicitly say is a double, it's going to be fine with that. It'll just convert the int to a double automatically. So it'll help us out, but once we write something, for example, uh, going from a double to an int, it's going to yell at us for that because there's truncation and loss of precision. Any other questions? 
Right, here's the, this is the last example that I'll run through a sample program and, and uh, you're trying to figure out how to use AutoLab and how to use IntelliJ with zip files. Uh, and then we'll have quite a bit of time to walk around and help you out with specific questions, uh, mostly setting up IntelliJ, I'd assume. But here's our last example today, conditionals. An if statement, the syntax is very much like uh, JavaScript, not quite like the Python. Uh, and you'll notice we have our braces, uh, parentheses, we have our braces, uh, unlike Python. Uh, white space doesn't matter. So the syntax is a lot more JavaScript-like, which is the syntax uh, for most languages. Python is kind of an anomaly, how it cares about white space and doesn't have braces all over the place. Uh, so very much uh, JavaScript syntax in the if statements and in a lot of this. Here, I'm defining a method, takes a double, returns a string, and I'm going to call it with a few values, and it's going to check whether the value I gave it was over uh, this large threshold, greater than 60, was it in between 30 and 60, or was it less than 30, it just returned a different string as a label based on whatever I gave it. So just a, a basic conditional. We're going to run our main method, and it's going to call all these, and we get exactly what we expect out of this. Uh, out of this code. So this statement is what we want to talk about here. Syntax should all look familiar. But what I want to focus on here is that I don't have a return statement. Yet I have a conditional which is going to return one of three separate choices. So I'm not telling Scala explicitly what value I want to return at any point. It's just going to be the last expression that's evaluated, uh, the last statement that's evaluated in the method call. So in our previous example, that was just the last line of the method. There wasn't much to think about there, it was just whatever that last line is, back to return that. But now, the conditional, since the conditional is our last statement, the conditional is going to decide what the last statement to be executed is, whether it's large, medium, or small. The conditional is deciding what that last value that's computed is going to be. So, uh, so we don't have any explicit returns, but the conditional is going to decide what's returned without any explicit return statements or anything. There's a bit of a beginner's trap. I saw a lot of issue with this last semester. The one big thing is if you add one line below here, below the if statement, maybe you just want to print out, uh, maybe you want to print out input or you debugging or something. I've seen things like that. Or just any logic after the if statement. Well, no, that's your last line to be executed, and that's your return value. And if your last line is a print statement, your return value is nothing. Print statement doesn't return anything, which we call unit in Scala. It's going to return unit, and you're going to get an error saying, hey, I expect you to return a string, but you return unit. What's going on here? Fix your stuff. Uh, so if you're using an if statement to return a specific value like this, just make sure that this statement is the last statement in, uh, in your method. Any questions? I would, uh, I think that's a case where I would use an explicit return statement. Uh, I think that would be the best one. There are, there are ways to do it, but I think that would be the best one. You can still use an explicit return statement and shut down the, the function or method. Uh, there might be a better way, but that's the, the one. If I had to code that right now, uh, that's what I would do. Uh, yeah, but in other languages, there's a, I don't know if you, you've seen this uh, before, if it was covered explicitly in 115. Uh, but in other languages, you can use a break statement. You can say, if I found whatever I'm looking for or whatever happened, uh, and then you say, loop break. That's going to exit that loop uh, and continue with your program without finishing going through that data structure. Yep. Uh, I have four questions. One, uh, you think it's like void in Java? Correct.
if I wanted to return a double instead of a string? Uh, I would do it the same way if this were a double instead of a string. I would just make sure the last line is whatever the last thing to be executed would be that. Right, it would be the same thing with doubles. If I if I wanted to label these as uh, like two, one, and zero, it would be the same same thing. Same idea. All right, so let's get to get to this demo. And then my last slide is just a lecture question again. Uh, again, the slides are. Post it so you can see the lecture question right on your own laptop. I will leave it on the projector though as I walk around. But let's do a quick demo. But let's do a quick demo. No, I don't want that. I'm gonna manually resize it. Bear with me. Okay, so I, I have the, the repo open here with just the code, but I want to show you how I would set up a new project. So say I just fired up IntelliJ for the very first time, a situation most of you are either in or were in yesterday or Monday. I'm going to file, new, project. Then I'll get that screen that we saw in the slides. I'm going to choose Scala and Idea, which is going to set up the structure of my project in a particular way. Uh, I'll name my project. I'll leave it as the very clever, clever title, Untitled 4, the fourth time I've done this. Uh, I'm using uh, Scala 2.12.6 here. Uh, I saw some of you having issues using the Scala workbook in the one tutorial that I posted. Uh, we won't be working using the workbooks in this semester. Uh, I, I, I forgot that that was part of that tutorial, so don't worry if you're not getting the workbooks working. They won't, uh, based on what I was reading, it wouldn't work with my version either. Uh, but we'll be defining our own classes and objects and running a program through main methods instead of using workbooks. So if you ran into that issue, don't fret. If you did update your Scala version, that's cool too. Um, uh, but just don't fret if you had that workbook issue. So when I create this brand new project, what I'm going to get and unfortunately, I can't, uh, don't have an easy way to zoom in on the sidebar here. But what I'm going to get is the project setup, but most importantly, this one folder called SRC for source. That's where all my source code goes. And if I'm doing the lecture question, I'm going to right click this, go to new package. I'm going to name that lecture. Inside lecture. I have to cheat. First object. I want to make sure I get this right. I'm going to go to new Scala class. And when I go to Scala class, it's going to ask me what kind I want. We're not declaring classes. We're not defining classes quite yet. So we'll go down to object. Create this as an object. First object and click OK. And this is where I can start zooming. That's going to set up my, my project in the way that AutoLab is expecting it to be set up. Then I can define my function. Not to give away too much of it here. But. Let's create a, a method that always returns zero. Uh, and what I strongly recommend, you're going to hear me say this way too many times, is get your testing going on right away. Uh, main, if you saw that shortcut, if you just type main in IntelliJ inside an object and then hit tab, uh, out, it, it's all muscle memory right now, I think it's tab, uh, it'll fill in the whole header of a main method for you. And then I want to just do a quick print line debugging here. Now if I print this, it's 25. And I would expect 5.0 to be printed out there. Uh, so call this on a few different values. Make sure you're getting the exact values that you want coming out of this. Now when I want to run this, 
I'll either click this green arrow here. Actually, I'm going to do it that way. That's the easiest way. I'm going to click this green arrow right here. Run it. And uh, I'm expecting five, but I got zero, so I know my code's wrong here, of course. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and submit anyway. And to do that, we're going to go to File again and Export to Zip File. i got to give a disclaimer here, a warning. Uh, last semester, we had a lot of issues where with certain operating systems, certain versions of IntelliJ, the latest changes weren't always reflected in the zip file. So if I believe the easiest solution was to go to save all, explicitly save. I think it was an issue with IntelliJ's uh, autosave feature, uh, which, by the way, fantastic feature. I, I'm addicted to it now. I always forget to save when I don't have that feature. But every time you type, uh, IntelliJ is always autosaving your stuff. So if your battery dies or something, you don't lose anything. It's very convenient. Uh, but anyway, go to export to zip file. I'm just going to save untotal4.zip. Then I'm going to head over to my browser. That's why I'm getting some echo. Uh, head over to my browser, go to Autolab. I added you all to Autolab this morning. So unless you added a course between uh, noon and uh, the beginning of the class, uh, you won't be in there. But you should all be in there. You should see the one lecture question. For August 28th, this is the same, same model lab that we used last semester. Uh, but you'll see, when you go to home, you'll see 116 in there. <laughs> Click here. Let me know that you didn't cheat. Submit. And I'm going to choose that zip file. So remember when, where you save that zip file when you save it. Wherever you save that, submit that. Uh, and that's your, that's kind of your game, that's your workflow for this semester. Uh, and and tell me, export a zip, submit the zip to, uh, to Autolab. Um, we got it down fairly simple. If you, then here's where everybody just matches refresh, uh, which is fine. Oh, that's going to be old. And now I can see my grade. I, of course, got a zero because that didn't do anything. All I did was return zero. And here's a big difference from uh, last semester. I'm not going to give you any feedback here. A big part of this course is testing. You can test your own code. For uh, today and, Wednesday, uh, and Friday, we're just testing using print statements. Call your methods and print out the return values and make sure it all checks out. On Wednesday, we're going to cover unit testing and introduce a more formal way of testing your code. I want you to be testing your own code. Autolab will not be there throughout your entire career. Uh, we have it in a lot of our courses these days. It's not going to follow you after you graduate. We need to prepare you to be able to test your own stuff. Uh, so that'll be a big focus. So here, I get this meme. They memed it last semester. Uh, you got a zero. Try again. If you get uh, if you get full credit, you get your points. So no feedback here. I want you to test your own code. If you're saying, I think it's right, but auto lab's giving me a zero. Myself, the TAs, what we're going to say is, show me your testing. How did you test this? What did you do that, to know that it's correct? What did you, what did you run? What did you follow up? Show me your input outputs. Show me where you pronounce the values for this one. Show me your unit tests. Sorry, I didn't come to say. That's what we're going to ask.
Uh, I got everything that I, I need to show the whole class. So let me put the lecture question back up.